These are never before seen pictures of one of the world's fighting elites, a branch of the international military known as special forces. In small patrols, these soldiers undertake covert missions far beyond the capabilities of conventional forces, often deep behind enemy lines. New Zealand is regarded as having one of the world's best special forces, having fought in many major conflicts for over half a century. It will go in, and if the task is possible to undertake, it will do it and it will achieve the objectives. New Zealand Special Air Service Group is an elite tier one special force. Yet despite ability for warfare in any terrain, there is almost nothing known about the New Zealand SAS. The unit has a strict no publicity policy, which they have rigorously upheld since its inception on the 1st of May 1955. We need to maintain a level of secrecy so that we don't compromise um, tasks that are currently underway or potentially future tasks. But its role in the global war on terror has taken the unit from the shadows and reluctantly placed it in the spotlight. In this series, our television cameras have been granted unprecedented access to New Zealand's most revered unit for two years. You will glimpse exclusive footage inside the world of New Zealand's Special Air Service, better known as 1NZSAS. For reasons of national security and to ensure no current operations or personnel are compromised, much about this unit and its activities will remain forever secret. This is what we can reveal. Every year, the 12,000 men and women of New Zealand's Defence Forces are issued a discreet invitation by the NZSAS to apply to join their number. Those who respond will discover this is no ordinary job application. A Special Forces soldier is trained in a number of military disciplines, and that right there is what distinguishes them from the conventional soldier. What you have is what are known as the one percenters. They're the uppermost one percent in both mental aptitude as well as physical aptitude. It will demand two years of utmost dedication and personal sacrifice before they'll discover if they have what it takes to join the exclusive one percent. And it all begins with the infamous selection course, seen here for the first time. Selection will submit these 50 volunteers from the Army, Navy and Air Force to a series of tests designed to meet the minimum standards for an SAS soldier. Tests such as an ability to survive days without food or sleep and to safely navigate unfamiliar terrain, always against the clock. By the last day, whoever is left standing will have gone through physical and mental hell. Unaware of what lies ahead, the volunteers have been standing resolute since dawn, trying to hide any signs of nerves. Each knows few will make it through the next 10 days. What they don't realise is some won't even make it through today. What was going through my mind was, you know, just settle down and, you know, it's, it's a long road to home. It was built up to be something that is extremely difficult. Not knowing what's going to happen and how you're going to react when it starts to happen. It's the hardest challenge that they've had to undertake in their military careers to date. Stand there! Hey. With the famous sand-coloured beret and blue belt as their prize, the volunteers must be prepared to give their all. For a number of you, you're going to be confronted with some very demanding challenges. It will really test you both physically and mentally. I would rather have no one pass a selection than lower the standards. Put your best foot forward and I wish you all the best. Next, some words of wisdom. Look this way. A veteran of missions in Malaya, Borneo and Vietnam, Honorary Colonel David Ogilvie is one of the unit's famous originals. Initiative, resourcefulness, physical guts, mental drive, all the things that we're looking for from you. Give it heaps. In everybody's mind, I think, when they enter selection is 
just imagine that when you're nearly at the top of that hill, that there's another hill beyond that. Everybody was feeling the pain, and you, but you had a guy on each side of you who was exactly the same. And they lasted one day, including some supposedly very fit physical training people. I think that, you know, the whole thing was a bit much for them. Now comes their first surprise. The volunteers have to empty their packs for a full inspection. What we have given them makes up 35 kgs. It's been checked prior to them coming. But history has shown there's always temptation for some to lessen the load. If you don't have some of those items, it makes you stand out. Move! Watching the volunteers every move are fully trained SAS soldiers, each with an innate understanding of what the unit needs, because they've had to prove it to get here. And it means they know all the shortcuts to look for. Yeah, can you be rattled? We can all be rattled. It's how quick some people get rattled compared to others. Those with missing items face a dressing down and a re-kitted. Get changed into PT kit. Move. These volunteers are as fit as they've ever been, following months of preparation. And they'll need to be. We have to induce a certain amount of stress and mental fatigue in a very short time period, just to test the individuals and, and their ability to withstand all of that. Cross! Cross! Shut! Listen up. On the command move, this is what I want to see happen. Leaving your weapons where they are, double down. Move! Straight away, they must prove their fitness levels. Anyone not meeting the 10-minute target will fail. When you want something in life, you know you've got to go after it. I came along very fit. I wanted to get in there. Nothing was going to stop me. Nothing. And I mean nothing. And they really gave it to me. Ten minutes, 18. Let's move over to the side here. The first test of selection, and already one man's dream, is over. That's it. If they don't meet the required standard of any of those fitness tests, they are removed. Without pause, they are set a barrage of physical tests to which they must give maximum effort. And while some outperform, others crumble. If you're lazy, you're going to have problems, eh? If you don't put the work in beforehand, it's going to catch you out. Chin comes above and back down full arm. Ensure that the legs stay naturally hanging at all times. All the way up. Guys get nervous before doing pull-ups and they lose all their upper body strength. G1 requirement, no more than 130. Here, no one escapes scrutiny, and a few have underestimated what's required. You start to see people drop out in the first couple of hours. In a heartbeat, they're back in fatigues as they're confronted with more hurdles. Tests that take several days in the conventional forces are crammed into the first few hours of SAS selection. We do all the physical tests that are required in the New Zealand Army. That's the standard that we set. The testing grounds are not restricted to dry land, as time and time again, they're sent back into freezing water during the morning. Move into the water. But pushing the threshold has been carefully calculated. They can press everything together in one day. And you think that if the whole selection's like this, you know, you're gonna have to dig a bit deeper. Down on the There's no respite and are straight into the next challenge. Up up. That rope. And by now, the body is starting to hurt. When you get back down, yep. you'll touch the ground, you get straight back up there. They will be starting to feel fatigued. Yep, stop there. You have to go back and start again. Soft. Endurance is probably the biggest one rather than physical strength. One more shot. Hurry up. Get up there. 
It's only midday, but for some, the dream is over. The selection course has sorts out those who can actually put to one side the the aggravation of of uh, the of the moment for the for the long term purpose of you know finishing was demanding physically, mentally, and I guess to a degree emotionally. It all just made you run everywhere. All the gear you had, quite often the gear would be scattered from back of the barracks to right down the headquarters because we wouldn't have it fitting properly. The temperature is rising fast on day one of selection for the New Zealand SAS. Already four volunteers are on their way home. They have a measure of military experience already. They are fit, they are well motivated, they are a lot tougher. The volunteers have undergone rigorous psychological tests to determine if they have the compulsory physical, mental and emotional balance that the unit demands. We use multiple sources, so we use the personality tests, uh, cognitive tests, we interview people, we look at their past performance. Past performance is one of the key indicators of future performance. You may get people who are attracted to the unit who uh, definitely not suited for service in the unit uh, because of their, their backgrounds, their profiling. If they don't meet the qualities, we can't recommend them. Afternoon brings on the real business of the day. And there are some who are just hanging in. They should be strong enough, fit enough to be able to take that into their stride and keep going. One eight kilometre force march by foot. Total 72 minutes to complete the task. Beware of oncoming traffic. Mike! If they fail to meet the time, look for arrest, infringe in any way, they will be eliminated. Every footstep carries the added burden of 35 kilograms on their backs. I was uh, fortunate enough to come from the battalion where you carry your house on your back. The combined load of the pack with survival gear, radios and weaponry is the equivalent of carrying two heavy suitcases. And with the clock ticking, it's all carried at a blister-inducing rate of seven kilometres an hour. As muscles cramp and leather boots rub toes raw, the field thins out. Even these seasoned soldiers are starting to feel the effects of the day. And you're starting to get blisters on your feet. You just got to cope with it. The pack cuts into your shoulders. It was going to hurt, but uh, my focus was getting through. If you look at pictures of soldiers, sometimes you see it's a little man who's carried the Bren gun. It's a little man who's carrying the machine gun. It's a little man who knows how to drive himself and has been doing that uh, all of his life. While most have made it to the end, there are still those who are over the 72-minute time limit. And again, there is no second chance. Well, you're gone. After 10 bruising hours, those remaining are loaded into trucks and driven deep into country to face the brutal chase known as the Hare and Hounds. Although tired and sore, they must chase a fresh and fast SAS soldier, the hare. This is a maximal activity. You want to run as hard as you can for the given distance. You want to stop when told to stop. At no time are you to drop behind the two sweepers. Group one, stoop. Those volunteers on borrowed time are sent first. Stand by, go. Therefore, at the end, they should be coming in around about the same time. And these two legs, you know, they, were, they weren't going to let me down. Go! To make matters harder, two more SAS soldiers act as sweepers, the hounds, and no one must finish behind them.
By now, it's not just weariness that is slowing them down. I think the boots play a big part as well. For me, I, I didn't choose the ideal boot for selection. I mean, if you can't walk, you can't, you can't finish. It's your wheels, really. All the way through there is pain. It is hard, it's very hard. You're starting to get blisters by this time. The boots just rub. The thought of being beaten by the clock or caught by the hounds is enough to spur most on. And there's one speed only. Just go for it. With time ebbing away, there is one last push to the finish line. You know if the bloke behind you passes you, you better start moving. As the faster runners reach the end, there is relief. But they've only made it through the first day of 10. Meanwhile, the stragglers are in danger of falling prey to the hounds. For the unluckiest, time has run out on selection. If anybody was truthful, it drives you on. You're going, I'm still here today. No, I'm not. After 11 hours of the 50 men who started out believing they had what it takes for New Zealand's special air service, nine were wrong. The first day will break you physically. So then you've got to, you've got to turn it on mentally. And as the remainder will soon discover, this was the easiest day. Lots of route marching, lots of sleepless nights, and uh, lots of pressure put on to see if we could handle. And all the time was this issue of, do I really want to be here? And of course, some people found out that uh, the sacrifice for them was not worth it. And about 3 a.m. in the morning, running down the road in a pair of shorts and bare feet, I told the instructor, Joe Glenn, as he is now, Joe Fotanga then, to stick his ass up any place he liked, and I was leaving, <laughs> and that was the end of the course. It's the next phase of selection for New Zealand's elite SAS unit. Those who survive the physical challenges of day one now face a far tougher test. Biggest challenge on our selection course is the second, third, and fourth days. Like SAS troopers operating behind enemy lines, the volunteers must navigate a route back to base via a series of checkpoints. Deceptively simple, open country navigation will prove the downfall of most on selection. Also, that's the isolation factor, minimal communication, and of course it's controlled in terms of how much sleep and food they get. The effects of food and sleep deprivation and strength sapping pack work are intended to play havoc with their ability to function. Reading a map proves a struggle. Watch the distance. How long do you reckon taking? One hour, 12 minutes done. But there is absolutely no help from those observing. There's no encouragement on the selection course because the individual has to be self-motivated. The NZSAS seek men who can think on their feet and operate alone. For some, this lack of guidance causes unexpected pressure, which increases as the pace hots up. A lot of people know they've got a certain amount of time, so that often weighs on people's mind. If they make an incorrect route choice, that often plays quite heavily. When you look at A to B, it might be the look most direct and fast, but you know you need to go A through D and E to get to B. My nav wasn't so hot. The thing I did was made sure I was quick on my feet, so if I made an error, I could make it up. Sadly, even some of the more experienced soldiers have not had enough instruction or practice at navigation. They know they've made a mistake and then people start thinking, I'm behind, how far behind am I? What am I really doing out here? Is this getting too tough? Once you've fallen behind in time, it's difficult to make it up. You're put in a position where a lot of people are thinking about quitting. 
and then they start that self-doubt process. And that's where people start to drop out. It's an unceremonial departure from selection for those who have given up. That second, third and fourth day is where we have the highest attrition rates. As the days blur together in the navigational phase, the volunteers struggle with the debilitating effects of sleep deprivation. We keep them occupied and awake because we also meter out the amount of sleep that they have. Tired. Despite an increasingly fragile emotional state, they must maintain the highest levels of soldiering. If they're not normally carrying their rifle with two hands on the weapon ready for use, it'll be frowned upon. One, two, three, four, five. It isn't long before exhaustion and the grind of hard days take their toll. Timings are harder and the food is less and people push themselves further and harder each day until they just blow. It's quite easy to see who's prepared and who's not. You know, are they still presenting themselves at checkpoints upright and uh, quite fresh, or are they head down, a bit moping, maybe look like they're doubting themselves? By now, even basic navigation is a challenge in concentration. And it becomes very mental, especially towards the end, because you're not getting food and you're not getting sleep. We are we? Your body keeps going. I mean, the body's a pretty amazing thing. The pain is here. Physically, mentally and emotionally low, more and more volunteers fall further behind. That's that decision point. I mean, you're back there, there's a pack, you can leave the pack there and walk away. You actually leave that pack back on your shoulders and keep going. But these soldiers are drawn on by ambition to be part of a distinguished band of brothers, an elite which has participated in conflicts around the globe since 1955. Like its modus operandi, little is known of the unit's origins. In 1940, Hitler was winning the battle for North Africa. Germany had forced Britain into desperate retreat. The British retaliation would not be through conventional airstrikes or using divisions of Allied tanks. Instead, it would come from a small British land unit that targeted enemy supply lines and stationary aircraft in hit-and-run raids. This was the birth of the SAS, the Special Air Service, the brainchild of a brilliant Scots Guard, Lieutenant David Stirling. Large raids lacked the necessary element of surprise, so Sterling devised a plan involving small groups of highly trained and superbly motivated men with more than a touch of maverick. Small groups um, inserted behind the enemy lines. It could inflict damage quite out of proportion to the number of people involved. Even their name, the Special Air Service, was designed to fool German intelligence that the attacks were from large air divisions. The SAS soon linked up with another motorised commando raiding party called the Long Range Desert Group, or the LRDG. Only a hundred men strong, the LRDG was stacked with New Zealand soldiers. He knew of New Zealanders as being, as he put it, farmers. And they knew how to look after their vehicles. They're very adaptable. If there's anything that could be done, they would do it. Like the SAS, the LRDG's methods were unconventional and missions clandestine. It wasn't normal for the Long Range Desert Group to wear any insignia that indicated who they were. A shirt, a singlet, a pair of shorts, and mountain climbing boots, and socks, that was our uniform, yeah. and a smile. Together, the SAS and LRDG travelled across the deserts wreaking havoc against the enemy. Shooting up convoys, blowing up dumps, I know the, how they found them, and raiding airfields. But they say that the SAS and the Long Range Desert Group destroyed more planes on the ground than the Air Force did in the whole of the Egyptian campaign. North Africa was New Zealand's introduction to the SAS. It would be the start of an enduring relationship, which today sees a new generation of hopefuls aspiring to join. And as the navigational phase moves into its final day, weary bodies rebel under the relentless pack marching. 
I got major blisters, my feet were majorly swollen to the point that um, a, a few days into the selection, I couldn't take my boots off or else I'd never be able to put them back on again. Straight across the, across the shoulders, because that's just the, the holding there. That's where all pain is. Fatigue and unpredictable terrain are the cause of sprains and strains. For those crippled by their exertions, bright red panels on their packs ensure easy pickups when aerial rescue becomes necessary. As the casualties mount, the numbers still in contention fall. These hardy few are now running on empty. People are going, well, if this is how I feel, at this stage, I'm not going to make it. Injuries, exhaustion and a loss of willpower mean this is the moment of truth. Yeah, there's a lot of people dropping out, eh? I've got nothing left. For three days on end, hungry and tired, they've marched with crippling loads. And then the navigation phase is over. For many, it's been a test of endurance beyond their limits. I think the pain was all over. I mean, the, the, the pain was all over your body. The remaining volunteers are returned to barracks. With their bodies and minds reeling and the promise of more days to follow, many realise their SAS dream is over. Sort of sitting down going, is, is this really for me? Um, what do I get out of it? Why am I doing it? Throughout the long night, knowing what lies ahead becomes too much for fragile psyches. A trickle of withdrawals becomes a flood. I think that staying awake um, when you've been awake pretty much for five or six days is, is the most difficult thing. It's the body's trying to, trying to shut you down. I've never been so crippled in my life as trying to walk in, in bricks, frozen bricks, with wet socks and, 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 and feet that resembled marshmallows. And I can recall being so tired that I saw some dairy cows that went past and they were upside down, walking upside down. There's only one way to join the New Zealand Special Air Service, to pass the arduous 10-day selection course. Not everyone passes, nor should everyone pass. Would not have the calibre of the soldiers they could handle the types of missions or tasks that they're expected to do. By day eight, the exhaustive search for the right recruits has meant that only seven of the original 50 volunteers remain. If being starved and kept awake for a week wasn't already enough to break their spirits, then the next task surely will. In addition to their combat load, they must carry a full 20-litre jerry can through harsh swampland for 24 hours. It's always been talked up as a nemesis and the, the thing that's going to exert most pain on your body and most pain on you mentally. I don't spend attention there. The challenging part is the fact that the people's minds believe that it's, it's, it is the hardest. Exercise Von Temsky. Yeah, this is our opportunity to weed out the dreamers from those who are going to carry on. Like when athletes hit the wall, this is our wall. And to make things even tougher, they must all take turns carrying a second jerry can. And they'll check to make sure those caps are tight, you know. If anybody drops any water out of those, you'll get a punishment for it. Identify north. Way you go. They will be told a direction to travel in, and that's pretty much it. Without deviating from their set course, they must push through whatever obstacle is in their path. Once Von Temsky is underway, there's only one way out, the finish. Soldiers don't have to reach any destination. When it's time to stop, the activity will stop.
Overloaded with little room to manoeuvre, it's a slow and painful trudge forward. It's just about putting one foot in front of the other, dogged determination to get through to the other end. That's a lot of weight, especially when you start carrying the two, because it requires more balance. And you've got your pack on your back, and you've got a rifle slung as well. Again, it's, a, it's another 40 kilos when you're talking about weight. But for dog-tired bodies, trying to put one blistered foot in front of another is agony. Can't get through that way, stop. Even the environment conspires against them. Yeah, I got cut up pretty, pretty heavily trying to push through. That's where it hurt. It really started to hurt. Hour after relentless hour, the task remains the same. It was cold. Two minutes. It plays havoc when you stop. It's generally when you cramp up, so the best thing is to keep going. A break offers little comfort as cold, wet clothes add extra weight and boots rub against raw blisters. My feet went soft and, and it was just a matter of letting them rot away at that time and sort it out later. Von Tempsky is performing to expectation, testing each man's fortitude to breaking point. Any thought of getting out of there or about going home, everything seems to cross people's minds at that point, you know, and it really tests their determination of, do they really want to be there? If the volunteers try to sneak in extra rest breaks, the staff push even harder. Hurry up, so take that long, sort out your gear. Knowing SAS troopers have endured far worse during actual missions. I don't know what the packs weighed, but they weighed more than we did. Probably one and a half times what uh, each individual weighed. While fighting raged in East Timor, an SAS patrol faced their own Von Tempsky in an effort to protect a village from armed militia. There was a particular village that was of interest to us. There was reports that militia were again harassing the, uh, the local populace. Facing impassable terrain, the only access was by foot, so each man had to carry his own equipment, supplies and water for ten long sunbaked days. Those were carrying, you had to carry four litres of water per day. So we, but we could only carry about seven days max. Plus we had the food, plus we had ammunition, uh, radios, our webbing, packs, sleeping gear. Um, so it just, it was out of control. I mean, we'd have to get lifted up on our feet by two people. Used to patrolling long distances and training, in East Timor, the terrain and pack weight proved exhausting. We could only walk for about 15, 20 minutes in about 35, 40 degree heat with no water before we'd have to have a break. It's mental and physical toughness which drives Special Forces soldiers beyond the capabilities of most. For 14 hours, those left have carried close to their own body weight through New Zealand's toughest terrain. It tests the individual, it, 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 it tests them to an extent that it, you question why you are here and why are you doing this. Just when the volunteers think they're getting a rest and some food, they discover it's not chocolate being handed out, but glow sticks. And uh, this guy said, oh, another 10 to go. I couldn't believe it. It just blew my mind. I said, you've got to be joking me, mate. He said, no, we've got another 10 hours to go. This moment is make or break in Von Tempsky. It's a big psychological barrier. you just got to get, in, get inside yourself and just keep pushing on. Somehow, all seven find the willpower to carry on. He has to have willpower, but he has to have that. He has to believe in what he's doing and, and have that determination, which comes from an absolute belief in your own ability to achieve and to keep going under any circumstances. Um, if he's got that, then he's got that different thing. After continuing all night, Von Tempsky finally comes to an end. The seven have made it through. Selection is almost over, but there is one final challenge ahead. It's not the fear of being on the, or, or the unknown so much about the selection course, but it's that nagging fear that you might not make it 
there were some very bad moments when you wanted to pull out. I thought I could finish the 10 days all right. Well, I was, my feet were like oh, plates of meat, I suppose, you know. Nine days ago, 50 men gathered at the secret location in a personal quest for selection into the New Zealand SAS. Only seven remain, but their bodies and minds are at breaking point. Now they face a 60 kilometre route march that will take all day and night to complete. It's a test of endurance, and all they have to do is get to the end. But the volunteers' bodies are on the verge of total shutdown. Physically, they are pretty much destroyed, um, although it's, it's imposed and it's monitored. Malnourished, vitamin deficient, it's their feet which suffer most. Lance them and tape them. Try and control them best you can. Bottom line, it's going to hurt. They're given their first decent feet in days. I mean, I lost about 10, 12 kgs probably. Uh, something horrendous. I've never been so hungry in my life. Seriously. This exercise is designed to test their will to the maximum. Can they continue to function to SAS standard at the extreme of their physical and mental tolerance? It is incredibly demanding, and by the end of it, most people are pretty knackered. But you have to pass, you have to get to the end. For one last time, they don heavy loads. You're mentally fatigued, physically fatigued, your feet hurt. It's the only 60 to go, eh? The volunteers must somehow find hidden reserves if they are to stand any chance of completing the 60Ks. Why does a rugby player want to be an All Black? It's the same sort of thing. For me, it was about being the best, best of the best. I still had this opportunity right in front of me. I wasn't going to let it go. Yeah, I'm nearly there. You know, I just got to walk the 60K. And you're at the start point, and it's like on your marks, get set. Go, you know, and you're away. One at a time, they begin their lonely march. But then those first steps was like, ah, oh, shucks. The whole, everything had seized up, and you're just like, get moving, get moving. For the first 10 kilometres, most push hard despite their frailty. Because you're not as quick as you were on the first day. And you're quite a few kilos lighter. Checkpoints come and go. Approaching the 20 kilometre mark, it's a struggle to maintain any momentum. You start winding back. You know, you can't take big steps. You've got to come in. Because you take big steps, you're really starting to, you know, pull on the muscles and that. By now, they've passed the point of no return as their bodies start to shut down. When do I stop for a five minute break? Do I stop for a five minute break? Because if you stop, then you seize up. With his legs cruelly failing him at the last hurdle, one man's dream is shattered. Into the final 30 kilometres of the march, the six remaining soldiers wage an internal battle not to give up. It's very much self-achievement in this particular instance. You've got nobody pushing you. Um, you want to be there. And you'll do anything to get there. I chose to be there. I didn't have to be there. I chose to be there. I could leave at any time. I wanted it. And I was going to run through a brick wall if I had to to get it. With 20 kilometres left, each man keeps going on pure willpower. It started to get dark and it started to hallucinate. You start to see things moving. And then you just you sort of go into a zone. You just look at the stars.
all sense of time is lost, and fearing they're falling behind, frustration sets in. You get to a checkpoint, you think, this must be the last checkpoint. Right? You keep going, and you just keep going, and that kept on happening. Then, out of blackness, a small glowing light appears. This is the end of selection. I didn't realise where what you'd achieved up for then. I think the, the body and the, the brain were sort of like on, oh, just shut down mode. One by one, the remaining volunteers reach the last checkpoint, barely able to stand. It didn't really cross my mind then. I just thought I'd finished and sweet. It's a great feeling to know how far you can go. It really is, to know that you can just keep going and going until your heart stops. With the last men in, their selection hell is at an end. sat down. Within a couple of minutes, my nose started to bleed. My feet were blistered. I knew I'd, I'd gone quite a long way. It was further than I'd ever gone before. After 10 days of selection, the ambitions of 50 have become the realization for just six exhausted men who have earned the right to train for the New Zealand SAS. If you ask anybody, who's been in the unit, what their proudest moment was, I think it would be when the selection panel says, you're in. G'day, Private. Please take a seat. Firstly, congratulations. You've done a, a tremendous effort just to pass the selection course and get to the end of it. We are happy to select you and take you for the training cycle and to give you the opportunity over the next nine months to prove yourself and show that you're capable of being posted to this unit. Well done. But today is only the beginning. They aren't a member of the unit yet. It'll take months of training to see if they have what it takes to become full members of the New Zealand SAS. You do get told this is the easy part. The, um, the hard parts have come. Next week, our cameras will follow the recruits through the demanding nine months of SAS basic training, known as cycle. For the first time ever, you will see just what it takes to earn selection into one of the world's fighting elites, the New Zealand SAS. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air. You are watching exclusive footage inside the world of New Zealand's Special Air Service, better known as 1NZSAS. Although the unit has a strict no publicity policy, its role in the global war on terror has reluctantly placed it in the spotlight. For two years, our television cameras have been granted unprecedented access to New Zealand's most revered military unit. 
for reasons of national security and to ensure no current operations or personnel are compromised, much about the New Zealand SAS's activities will remain forever secret. This is what we can reveal. Four months ago, 50 volunteers from the Army, Navy and Air Force were invited to the toughest selection process in the armed forces. It's the hardest challenge that they've had to undertake in their military careers. The prize, the chance to become an SAS soldier. It's every young man's dream. But for the dream to be realised, these volunteers had to make it through 10 days of hell as they were put under the microscope and pushed further than ever before. Get up there. When athletes hit the wall, this is our wall. Each day, the unsuitable were weeded out. Not everyone passes, nor should everyone pass. As their bodies and minds were pushed to breaking point, the numbers dropped until, by the end, just six were left standing. Well done. For each man, it's a significant personal milestone. You do get told this is the easy part. The, um, the hard parts have come. After a summer restoring fitness and leaving regiments and families behind, the successful six are joined by two more. Usually we have some people who may have been injured on previous cycles. First, the trainees are shown to the barracks they will call home for the duration of cycle. Among them are two officers who endured additional days of tests after selection in order to qualify for cycle. And you got, they got nine months to either develop it, unleash it or confirm that there's nothing there. While Cycle offers a sneak preview of life inside the unit, the trainees will seldom mix with badge members. That privilege will only come if they prove their worth over the next nine months. We are looking at this individual. Does he have what we believe now that he's shown us? Can he go further and conduct the other nine months of uh, training? Does he have the right temperament? Does he have the right intellect? Is he a good team player? You want to interview this one? Get down, give me 20. Stuff. Hurry up. Hey! After a thorough inspection, they are introduced to the regimental sergeant major, the RSM. Dedicated to upholding the standards of the unit, the RSM is the soldier's soldier who has risen through the ranks and commands the utmost respect. Cycle, stand at pace. Stand easy. Right, welcome to day one at the unit. Today you commence your basic cycle of training. It'll be testing, it'll be demanding. If you cannot keep up, you'll be removed from the cycle. If you dislike the person standing next to you, leave those thoughts and feelings at the gate when you come in. You'll be required to work together, to eat, sleep and socialise together. You will learn to rely on the people standing around you. You must trust them with your life. For the next nine months, you will conduct yourself around this camp in double quick time. You will run everywhere. Train hard, fight easy. Course, course shun. Once you decide to do the cycle, you give it at your all. First thing they did was to disrupt your routine so there was nothing regular. Um, I remember the first morning, we jogged towards the mess uh, for breakfast, but we ran straight past it and we were into a um, pretty vigorous uh, period of physical training. And uh, I thought, good heavens. Uh, people wouldn't even talk to you. Uh, yeah, you weren't worth much to them. You, you'd only just passed selection. You, you were just someone who wanted to be at that stage. Although it may be every young woman's dream to marry <laughs> An SAS trooper, reality soon strikes home when uh, she hasn't seen a young trooper for nine months out of a year. The unit's newest trainees are about to discover that what they will learn is far beyond any conventional soldiering. Training is a combination of uh, some serious book learning interspersed with uh, unbelievable physical training. And therein lies the story, because sometimes it's hard to study books when you're physically exhausted, but that's exactly why they do it. 
and they must strive to live up to the ethos of their British peers, 22SAS, the benchmark of the International Special Air Service. These are our tenets. Remember them and live by them daily. Number one, the unrelenting pursuit of excellence. The first few weeks are crammed with mental and physical challenges. About teamwork today. Number two, maintaining the highest standards of discipline. They are no longer treated as just soldiers. At the end of this course, you will be able to plot and measure a course. Number three, the SAS brooks no sense of class. What I want to go through now is the setting up of the Bear Can Satellite Antenna. Number four is humour and humility. Down! Go on! Get it down there, push it, let's go, go! We'll do this all day. MAG 58, M203, M4, C9, various foreign weapon systems. You will master them. You will know them inside out. They must absorb a huge arsenal of weaponry for conventional and counter-terrorist tasks. Everything was... The top, it's 100% or just below. Hurry up, too slow! Stuffing around! You wanna be in this unit? The pace is non-stop. They run everywhere, either training or preparing for exams. You might finish at the end of the day, and then you're gonna spend the next few hours studying because you've got an exam the next morning. Calculate the explosive content required to cut six 50 mil cables using P4. Up! You might have bluffed it throughout the selection. They're looking at to make sure they it was the real deal that they, that they saw in you. But it's an unsuitable personality that proves the undoing for one soldier. In such a small group, you get to see people warts and all, and, and sometimes, you know, the faces actually don't fit. A failure to bond with his peers has dire consequences for one man's SAS dream. We will cull them away and they'll never come back. Left front guard, move. When operating behind enemy lines, move. they must be able to take care of themselves with or without a weapon. Based on World War II hand-to-hand -hand techniques, they're taught the art of close quarter battle, CQB. You learn combat. Uh, you learn how to disarm people. You learn how to fight, how they want you to fight. The key to this, to sell a punch, to sell the old Hollywood. Drawing on martial art techniques, this training will save their lives on operations. That's good, good fight. It will definitely be a case of kill or be killed. So we have to train with that in mind at all times. During milling, a fighting technique using an open-handed punch, they must show no fear or mercy against their peers. Inflicting pain on your friends? Yeah, it, it, it tests you, you know, because at the end of the day, it can be a bit of ill feeling in there. Remember what you've been taught. Keep your helmet on, keep yourself covered up, lock horns, go hard. Go hard. Stand by, fight! This is no fight club. But the trainers expect a full-blooded contest using controlled aggression. There's a fine line going too far or not going far enough and the instructor bollocking you because you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. Look what's going on. Keep your guard on, cover up, get back in there. You can't take a few knocks in CQB. You're going to fail. And again. Fight! 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 The collateral damage is split lips and broken noses. CQB is merely a start. The next challenge will take them behind enemy lines. We soon got to uh, realise that SAS really stood for Saturdays and Sundays because we worked every damn weekend. We did have a constant string of um, injuries, particularly from parachuting, bad landings, um, cliff climbing, things like that, where, you, where you're going to have injuries anyway because of the nature of what you're doing. So there was a bed in Ward 10 that was nearly always occupied by one of our chaps, so it was called the SAS bed. The rule is look straight out and jump straight out. 
into nothingness. I mean, it's, it isn't natural. In fact, I never got have liked it at all. After an intense first month, the trainees on cycle have learned to be an SAS operative takes much more than just physical presence. There are certain things that you can train a soldier, sailor or aviator to do. What is more difficult to do is to train the mind and, you know, and to, to change a person's mental outlook. The wrong attitude has cost one man already. It's a huge pressure cycle. Yeah, you, you just don't know if you're going to be there the next day. The next phase of cycle harks back to the original SAS Desert Raiders and the Long Range Desert Group in World War II. The ability to infiltrate behind enemy lines kickstarts any SAS mission. The cycle members must learn the access techniques of land, sea and air. They have to have the ability to function in those environments. If they are going to effectively plug and play into the unit, The first infiltration skill is rock climbing. Having acquired the basics of abseiling in a controlled environment, the manoeuvre is attempted on a sheer cliff face. You don't really want to muck it up, it's a long way to fall. This is no weekend climbing course. Though weighed down with a 40 kilogram combat pack, unexpected obstacles like this bush and a ticking clock. Technically, these performances are poor, so once at the bottom, the trainees are ordered back up the cliff. They're better, but not much. The cycle instructors are unimpressed. Their message is blunt. Only drastic improvement will guarantee their continuation on cycle. For to be trusted, person's got to be trusted when you tell them to do something you've got to know in your own mind that they're going to do it do it to the best of their ability uh, I must say we did have a few people that wouldn't do it but they don't last long because someone will catch them out in the finish now mountaineers must become mariners as they learn the second infiltration skill by sea the trainees must be able to maneuver these small, fast Zodiac boats in all weathers, busy ports and harbours, and rough open sea. They must know how to beach craft on rugged coastlines. And if all goes wrong, repair a malfunctioning engine. How to navigate on the sea. How to survive in the sea. You just make sure you can swim very well. The bottom line is, is take your seasick pills. During the sea training, it's again evident some are struggling to achieve the standards expected. Well, if you don't achieve it, they're gonna, you're not going to be there the next day, are you? If you don't pick up something quickly and how they want it to be done, and that's just the basics. A lot of them will simply make wrong decisions that in combat will get them killed. It's no surprise when the trainers decide on a direct course of action. You know why you're here, so please take a seat. Groups of privacy? Yeah. For one cycle member, there's been too many mistakes. As another goes, the pressure on the remaining six to succeed reaches a new intensity. They just up the ante a bit more and uh, make selection look easy. The third infiltration skill by air is bread and butter for the New Zealand SAS. For 50 years, the unit has taught its members how to parachute behind enemy lines, a skill it has perfected. No cycle member will pass until he has taken his first jump. So they begin a rigorous training program to get them out the rear door of a Hercules at extremely low altitude. I think being on cycle, it pushes you that little bit harder. And you're expected to go the extra mile. The countdown to their first jump begins as the lumbering Hercules rises from the tarmac.
The trainees have less than a thousand feet to ensure a safe landing. Even a tiny misjudgment could prove fatal. You're not really thinking about the jump, thinking more about what you've got to conduct whilst under canopy, uh, whilst in the aircraft, very much the drills. At this moment, any phobias or reservations must be put aside. At this stage of a person's training, there is no way that they're not going to jump out of that aircraft. Stepping off the back of that herc is just one big window out the back and you take that first step by walking through a door. During cycle, there'll be many jumps, some as great as 12,000 feet. But their first is the most memorable, and the lowest. Everything happens rather quickly. You don't get a lot of time under canopy at 1,000 feet. In a matter of seconds, the trip to Earth is over. Dangle and thump, you know? You fall and you hit the ground hard. All land safely, and this time, no one is cold. It was absolute, uh, absolute crap. You get a timely reminder from the uh, DS. There's only so many chances that you get before you're released. If nobody finishes, we're fine with that because we're not going to drop our standards just to have people come through the front gate. There is one final infiltration skill to learn. From Vietnam to Afghanistan, SAS patrols have used helicopters to insert into some of the deadliest hotspots. Now the cycle members must learn how to exit safely from a fast-moving chopper. The task is repeated until the rough edges are ironed out. First, they are taught the art of repelling. With the directing staff giving them close attention, errors must be avoided. Here they abseil 30 metres to the ground with nothing but terra firma to break the fall. It's a fast way to get where you're going. Attempting to infiltrate into jungle conditions proves far tougher. Finally, the trainees must ascend a single swarm rope, an essential skill for landing in high-rise urban surroundings. Like all cycle courses, the manoeuvre is rehearsed until it's second nature. All succeed. The infiltration phase is complete. Next, the trainees will move on to the battlefield. We really live like pigs, you know, grovelling around on the jungle floor and what, and never once did anybody complain. You'd look around, they'd give you a big smile and the thumbs up. Maintaining that uh, mental toughness of, OK, what's around the corner? There's a new job coming up. OK, let's get ready for that. Planning, rehearsals, preparation. What doesn't leave you are the memories, like the, the good old soldiers. Well, they remember all the good times. They'll forget about the leeches and whatever else and, and you know, being very tired and getting shot at. It's Anzac Day. The cycle members have joined the unit, veterans, family and friends, for a private memorial service at Squadron HQ. Today we pause and we salute and we give thanks to God for those who have prepared to suffer and die under the banners of justice and freedom. They shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. For the soldiers remaining on cycle, it's time to head into the field for a sustained period of patrol training. Did my uniform remind me daily of the traditions of the Special Air Service of which I am part? If I'm inclined to doubt, steady my faith. If I'm tempted to sin, make me strong to resist. 
if I should miss the mark, to be encouraged to try again. For this next phase of cycle, the six will spend months living and working in a landscape of forest, mountain and scrub. The very same landscape that half a century ago played host to 800 hopeful recruits. Inspired by the British SAS, New Zealand formed its own special air service on the 1st of May, 1955. The job of establishing this elite force would fall to a visionary officer, Major Frank Rennie. Because of his um, background in training, he knew exactly what he wanted for his SAS squadron. An applicant had to be preferably single, under six foot, weigh less than 83 kilos, have their own teeth, good eyesight, no criminal record, and be above average intelligence. He wanted um, endurance, integrity, um, personal drive. By winter, the 800 hopefuls had been cut down to 180 men. At Waiuru military camp, they began a rigorous process to become New Zealand's first SAS soldiers. Say that our feet never touched the ground it would be would be literally true because we started running and we ran everywhere and ran we ran everywhere for the next six months. The applicants would have to prove their skills in weapons handling and navigation. The training was always very physical. The infamous scaffold course being one of the challenges. You had to jump gaps, climb from one level to the next, perhaps carried somebody in a fireman's lift. Then there was a flying fox, which to get down to the bottom. It was a diabolical thing. In his drive for excellence, Rennie turned everything into a contest. Running competitions, initiative tests, always pitting troop against troop. He had a famous saying, uh, Smith, you better buck up. You'd yeah, be in the B team. Such was the competition that everyone wanted to be in Rennie's SAS. But there was only room for 133 men. And there were four left. And they had to be told uh, by the commander that they'd failed. Uh, and that was very difficult for them, especially. Uh, one of them uh, broke down and cried. Seven days a week they trained, and then Rennie said he was satisfied. Today, it's another generation struggling through winter at Waiuru military camp. It's cold, it's miserable, and you feel like you're literally right on the arse end of it. Everything the six have learned so far on cycle is gearing them to the heart of any SAS mission, operating as a patrol. It's definitely about trying to bond this group of individuals into a very tight-knit group. What they learn now will keep them alive on deployment overseas. In the main, you will not see SAS taking the offensive against an opponent. They will lay in wait and obviously stage ambushes, uh, but they will do a lot of reconnoitering. They will do a lot of intelligence gathering. Operating in small groups is a fundamental part of the unit. Being able to do that will see the success or not of missions that you will undertake if you complete and successfully pass the cycle of training. Work hard as an individual, work hard as a team, and the tenants that you've had drilled into you over the period of the training to date, hold them in high regard, hold them in your mind, hold them in your heart, and give it shit. Retreating into the undergrowth for weeks at a time, they honed skills based on the unit's campaign history. It's the next dimension into the training. You learn a lot of your, uh, your bushcraft. Here, veterans from Vietnam observe the trainees' every move during a silent patrol. Your movement wasn't too bad, but there's one thing that, that really stood out to me, and that was you were bumping against trees. That's where I was picking you up from way the hell back. Next, they learn to evade and track the enemy using skills that have made the New Zealand SAS world famous. You can learn about your prey, what they're eating, their morale, how much weight he's carrying, everything about them. You learn about that by tracking these people. 
Every broken branch and misplaced rock has a story to tell, as the soldiers learn to decipher trails in the undergrowth. After three months, the trainees are tuned into the landscape, able to lie silently and wait, often for days at a time. Imagine four or five people sitting there for up to five days, not moving, not being able to cook or heat water or for a hot drink or cook their food, having cold food, and having enemy activity as close as 10 feet away from you. There was a lot of cold sweats as well as hot sweats. A feature of this training is the way unit veterans ensure lessons are new, but old ones aren't forgotten. Wasteful to fire all four or six or eight claymores that you're carrying when you're only going to get two or three kills on the track. Most importantly, they must prepare for contact with the enemy. Righto, let's go to it. As with any operation, an enemy ambush can occur at any time. When it comes, the trainees must react immediately. But failure to respond appropriately means one more soldier is dismissed from cycle. None of the others see him removed. Month six of cycle, the five remaining trainees have now acquitted themselves with many of the basic requirements of an SAS trooper. But still their life on cycle is precarious. They are not posted to the unit. They are only under assessment and they can be removed at any time. It's self-induced, the pressures that you put on yourself to perform because you know you're going to such a professional unit. Hey, target destroyed. They do have to be committed to excellence. They do have to be dedicated. They do have to be professional. They do have to want to belong to this organisation. On overseas deployments, the NZSAS is often called to do the jobs nobody else can. On cycle, this means destroying enemy targets using an array of heavy weapons. Foreign now. Missing means mission failure. If you're humbled enough times, you make mistakes. Then the pressure's going to be put on you even more to see if you can sort yourself out. Let them have it. By this stage of cycle, Burn. failure or success is measured in millimetres. From here, we'll move on to the um, 84s. Provided your weapons are very good, what else do you need? And using your nose and your eyes and your ears. Everybody was a professional and um, they knew that those skills were required, perhaps not tomorrow, but the next day or the day after. That's where you start getting to grips of what the SS is all about. After six gruelling months, the five soldiers on the NZSAS training cycle have reached crunch time. By the end of it, you know their ins and outs, you know their strengths and weaknesses. Next, they must prove they can function as a patrol, working behind enemy lines. The trainee patrol must destroy key targets with carefully placed explosives. You're taught in the military to treat every weapon as if it's loaded. 
you treat every piece of ordnance as a weapon. You treat it with respect. Once the mission is underway, there's no turning back. Ever alert for an unseen enemy, the patrol's first objective is to destroy the barbed wire perimeter. Now the long hours of classwork theory will be put into operational practice. They must strategically position measured explosives for maximum impact. The training staff now add incoming fire to test their metal. You can't afford to make a mistake. You've got to be thinking on your feet all the time. And like any mission, it's not over until the patrol is safely extracted. Now the mission's fate will be judged by the flick of a switch. The trainees take this minor victory in their stride because they know the next challenge has been the end of many a soldier on cycle. I'd get quite, I guess, nervous is the word, and I'd have difficulty sleeping, uh, difficulty eating, and, and the fears that, that I had were that I was going to do something that was going to cause my guys to be captured. Spring arrives bringing the final cycle exercise, Operation Great Escape. Great Escape is a final testing exercise, which is the test of them as a patrol. It's what it's all about, accumulation of everything you learned and then to go and test it. The instructors will now learn how the trainees cope when being hunted down by a large enemy force. Operation Great Escape will put them in that very real scenario. It's a will to live, will to survive, and yeah, you will to succeed. By the time this exercise is over, the fine line between training and the realities of war will have been blurred. You treat it like a course. You've gone through all the other courses and that, so you want to pass. Oblivious to the exact location, they are inserted 150 kilometres into enemy country. They just dropped us there and said, well, off you go. On the run, they must use their wits and guile to gather vital intelligence, then deliver it safely to a rendezvous while avoiding capture. The patrol has just five days to achieve its mission. The patrol is vastly outnumbered by the hunter force. Although this is just an exercise, all treat it as deadly real. Mission. The company is to capture the enemy patrol through ambushing in order to ensure the continued security of New Zealand. The manhunt begins. The skies fill with search helicopters and the army mobilizes. Meanwhile, the patrol must rely on its own footwork to cover the ground. You know the hunter force is looking for you. You got certain checkpoints to meet. I mean, the control of your, your destiny, if you like, is in your hands. The patrol knows the only way to achieve its mission is to keep going through the night. But so does Hunter Force. Day two, and Hunter Force has blocked all the main routes as its ground forces push deeper into the countryside. Knowing their pursuers are close by, the patrol is confronted with an open track. Their dilemma, cross and risk ambush, or head back towards the search party. You make the wrong decision, you get caught. It's not long before the dogs pick up the patrol's scent and the chase begins. At an open crossroads, they face exposure, but make it through unseen. If the dog teams are on your tracks, then you gotta move faster than them and, and drop their scent. Day three, the air throbs with activity and the patrol again goes to ground. All the time, Hunter Force gets closer. As the choppers pass overhead, the patrol takes its chances in the dense undergrowth in a bid to confuse the chasing dogs. They move fast enough to drop the scent and only just make it to the checkpoint. 
They are given vital intelligence that must not fall into enemy hands under any circumstances. It is really black and white when you look at it. Say nothing and get out of there is the, is the aim. It's day four of Operation Great Escape and the patrol is exhausted. You're there living and breathing for 24 hours. You're, you're doing it without sleep, yeah? You're doing it without food. They can only rest when hunter force allows. Preferably a place that's pretty ugly, you know, where you don't think the enemy party will look for you or want to go in there. Desperately behind on time, the patrol spies a shortcut, but is it an ambush? Your mind's thinking about what if, what could happen. Remembering what they've been taught from the veterans, the patrol correctly deduces that the broken foliage means a trap. They retreat into the undergrowth. It's the final night of Operation Great Escape, and Hunter Force intensifies their efforts. With 30 kilometres still to go, the patrol meets a waiting van to take them to their final destination. After five days on the run, their bodies steal a much needed rest. Try and get some rest if you can, guys. This relaxation will prove a terrible mistake. The patrol has given up the safety of the undergrowth and they're heading straight into an ambush. For five days and nights of Operation Great Escape, these soldiers have evaded capture from a large enemy force. They believe their task is finally over. The reality is, there is no great escape. They're being driven straight into an orchestrated ambush. Now surrounded by the entire hunter force, there's no chance of escape. The lot of a special forces trooper who is captured by an enemy is a very unhappy one. The best thing that can happen is that they die quickly. That makes it imperative that they be trained in interrogation techniques, which in turn means that they have to be able to withstand brutality. It's an unfortunate part of the business, but it's a very ugly business to begin with. For five long hours, they remain face down in the back of a lorry. You've just got to prepare yourself mentally as much as you can for what happens next. Now they're driven to an abandoned cabin in the middle of nowhere for their final ordeal. It does involve taking these soldiers into the darker recesses of the human psyche, and it does involve physical pain. But if they don't explore these things in training, they are more likely to crack immediately when they fall into enemy hands. It's about tufting this little nut up and saying that, you know, you can get through it. It's very much a challenge to, to maintain focus. Are you going to break? One by one, they're led away to face their fate. If people haven't assimilated the skills required, then our options are really there's only one, and it's that we remove them at that point of time. It's a scene that only those involved in may witness. Forty-eight hours later, they are finally released. They didn't crack. All five soldiers are through.
it's been a profound experience. It's not something anybody really talks about. The experience itself is between you and the interrogators and the people that were there. Um, because it is, um, to a degree, um, humiliating. Um, dangerous if it's not controlled properly. Um, and, yeah, it's not something you go and crack a bottle of champagne over. But it is, it is I believe, um, something that, that is needed. One year ago, 50 men set out to join the NZSAS. Today, only five have earned that badge. To be badged, uh, for us, to be badged in the SAS was um, uh, the highlight of, our, uh, of my career anyway. Well, went home and well, on leave and I thought I was the king of the castle and I felt it ever since. When you put that beret on, you must feel ten foot tall. Said, "Oh, done that, and um, now let's um, try and demonstrate that you're worthy of it." Right. We are the Pilgrims, Master. We shall go always a little further. It's not about the marching. It's not about that. It goes deeper. It, it's more of a, a sense of achievement within Ireland. Today, two families combine. The families of those being badged with a family that is one NZSAS group. We're all, yeah, yeah, humble. New Zealand Special Air Service Bureaus are presented to those personnel who have qualified on the NZSAS basic cycle of training. Your turn for operational service will come soon enough. Congratulations, we wear this bear over pride. You have a great deal more to learn, and remember always the pursuit of excellence. This is a significant rite of passage. You now stand with us and share a bond unlike any other. You are now one of us. All the lessons you've learned through cycle and selection, knowing that you can go that little bit further. All the skills that you've picked up. And knowing that that's just the beginning. That's only just the beginning of what's really going to come. In the world of the New Zealand SAS, the door has only just opened. You've achieved a lot to get to that basic level of capability and be a posted member of the unit, but now you have to live it. Next week, for the first time ever, you'll see the inner workings of one of the world's fighting elites the New Zealand SAS. Our cameras will follow the newly badged troopers as they acquire counter-terrorism skills, essential for modern warfare. Where even New Zealand could become the battleground. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air. Somewhere in the North Island is a maximum security military base, home to one of the world's best special forces, the New Zealand Special Air Service, better known as 1NZSAS. Although this unit has a strict no publicity policy, its role in the global war on terror has reluctantly placed it in the spotlight. For two years, our television cameras have been granted unprecedented access to New Zealand's most revered unit. However, for reasons of national security and to ensure no current operations or personnel are compromised, much about this unit and its activities will remain forever secret. This is what we can reveal.
A year ago, 50 hopefuls from the Army, Navy and Air Force took part in the infamous NZSAS selection course. It's the hardest challenge that they've had to undertake in their military careers. Why does a rugby player want to be an All Black? It's the same sort of thing. By the end, only a handful remained. I wanted it. And I was going to run through a brick wall with a head to get it. Eight soldiers then underwent nine months of training in the arts of elite soldiering from the New Zealand SAS instructors. It's nine months of a large number of courses that each individual has to pass. And not only pass, but do very well at. Now they're going to start moulding you into what they want. But before the end of this period, more would be come. Eventually, five were invited to join one NZSAS. You form a strong bond with everybody on your cycle. The guys I came through are my best friends, you know. We're this bear over pride. This is a significant rite of passage. You are now one of us. It's taken 12 momentous months for these five soldiers to become part of the NZSAS. During this time, they've had little to do with other SAS personnel, living outside the compound and only gaining access to restricted parts of the camp for training. Today, all that changes. It's been a long nine months getting there, um, and you were there for a job. You, you weren't there for, to, to bask in the glory. Uh, you know, there were jobs to be done, and you want to get on and do them. Now the unit's newest troopers will find themselves assigned to a division of the unit known simply as A Squadron. They'll be split up from their cycle, they'll be farmed out amongst the unit, and they'll be expected to contribute straight away. An inconspicuous metal shed is their base. Welcome to A Squadron, I'm Jordan Sergeant Major, welcome aboard. The Squadron Sergeant Major greets them for a tour of their new home. This area we're going through now is the regimental area. Keep an eye on the notice boards, that's where you'll find out what's happening with you at certain times. This is the A Squadron hangar. This is where most of your equipment and that will be kept. As new members of the squadron, they'll serve a two-year probation period and learn the standards expected of an SAS soldier working alongside their more experienced peers. It all begins, isn't it? it yeah, you get your clothing, um, you get your kit handed out to you. The quartermaster supplies apparel for every possible role. Fatigues for jungle, desert and counter-terrorist activities. Now make sure it's all there and then sort at the bottom. But these uniforms only hint at what it means to be part of the NZSAS. The three words which are commonly used, community, far and our family, the only ways express those very strong mental and emotional bonds. My wife has accepted the fact that if one of my guys phone up for some reason, I'll drop what I'm doing to help him. And I've been doing that for 30 years or something, 35 years. And she knows that although she is the number one person in my life, definitely Zeus is number two. In my first day at work, uh, I got told, go home, come back in civvies, and tell your wife, you don't know when you'll be home next. That was my introduction to the unit. The soldiers wait quietly to meet their new boss, the commander of A Squadron, who offers some words of advice. They're moving from a structured, formalised teaching environment to a informal environment that the squadrons are. I'm sure people of mine have already suggested to you, don't know, go to your heads, but I'm sure that you won't. Put your heads down, work hard, that's how you earn respect around here, particularly with you guys. It's a little bit more relaxed, eh? You know, they're not barking at you, they're giving you good advice. Probably an old saying goes around this place that says, you know, getting in is hard and staying in is harder. That's, I mean, to unsettle you, here we expect guys be told to get on with the job and then once they've been told that they just they just get on with it. You feel the train wheels just drop straight off and you know whack there's personal responsibility. But there's still one more briefing. Now the new troopers are called to an address from the unit CO, its highest ranking officer. Boss they're ready. You get taken through People looking down at you, you're wondering, OK, how do I fit into this? Their roles are as peacekeepers, information gatherers, fighters in the international war on terror. Gentlemen, you have reached a significant milestone. You have earned the right to wear the coveted unit wing dagger, beret and badge. The CO's message is straight to the point. 
today, your job's just got a lot tougher. September 11th, 2001, saw this unit transform itself to meet a new and emerging threat. When the time comes, I can assure you, there will be little or no warning. You must be efficient and ruthless in the execution of your duties because there will be no second chance. With this, the gauntlet has been laid down for the new troopers. How can I show them that, I'm, that I am what I am? And um, how can I prove myself to them? One final ritual awaits the squadron's newest members, a well-earned beer. Great Jason's well done. Great Jason's. Good work. The SAS is very much a, a close family. So once in the family, uh, you know, they look after each other uh, exceptionally well. Cheers, fellas. Cheers. Now it's time to start work in earnest. You are expected as a badge member of the unit to contribute the pressure will be on them. You know, you have to live up to those standards. Um, and that is a challenge. As NZSAS soldiers, they must master a variety of advanced skills. OK, gents, what makes Special Operations Forces special? In the world of Special Forces, New Zealand's SAS ranks among the best with their ability to infiltrate anywhere by land, sea or air as long-range intelligence gatherers, as soldiers who can take direct action against an enemy, and for their anti-terrorism and counter-terrorism skills, known by the unit as Black Roll. We're jack-of-all-trades to a certain degree, and we need to be able to take those skills that we have and apply them wherever a given task comes up, because some of these things, as we've uh, discovered in the last few years, just come out of the blue. They have to have skills that go across a range of different environments and a range of different scenarios. Uh, I think that they have those competencies and I think that they can bring their skills to bear on a range of different situations where New Zealand might be called upon to protect its own interests and the interests of the international community. Their first task as an SAS soldier goes to the very heart of the unit's tenants humility. Once you pass cycle, you get your broom handed to you and told that's yours. You know what to do with it. For the next year, you're on probation. You're the broom boy. You're the, um, you're the pleb. If you can't pick up a broom and sweep, where's your humility? They will be expected to accept where their position is and uh, learn their trade and, and, and start advancing from there. Sweeping in silence, each trooper contemplates how much they have to learn. But they know somewhere, sometime, they will be called into action. Uh, there was thawing, of course, you know, you, you sort of kind of realise that no, I've, I've, um, I'm part of, the, part of the family now type thing, uh, but I've still got a lot to prove. So you're taking the first big step. Everyone's very motivated. You motivate each other. It's just a really good atmosphere to be in. Guys are really uh, clicky. Maintain a high degree of readiness. Uh, they must maintain a high standard of training because um, certainly the climate that we live in now, uh, you just never know if something's going to happen. Although they are now part of the New Zealand SAS, the unit's five newest troopers are on a two-year probation to prove they have the right stuff. You're going to be the dog's body, you know? You are going to sweep, you are going to volunteer for everything. So you're still pretty low down the food chain. It's a period where they go through and flesh you out. You've only got the basic skills and they need a lot of refining. As they begin their second week in the squadron, the five are about to discover what being a Special Forces soldier means today. The battlefields of open desert and thick jungle are no longer the sole arena for SAS missions. Over time, it's moved from strategic reconnaissance and hit-and-run raid activities to countering terrorism. Would-be opponents of the West learn from Gulf War I that you have to fight asymmetrically. That is, you have to get underneath 
the conventional force umbrella of larger established states. Conventional warfare has given way to guerrilla strikes, hostage situations, and acts of terror. That is the nature of the forces that we're up against in the world today. Far more than any conventional threat to New Zealand, we face the threats of terrorist groups, of uh, uh, insurgency groups. And that's where special forces come in. Special forces fight the asymmetric warrior like an asymmetric warrior. They meet him where he lives. They take the battle to him in the same measure that he would take it to the West. As NZSA's soldiers, they must learn to counter this threat with maximum efficiency. At this battle training facility, painstaking hours are spent acquiring these skills. Wow, your weaponry, you can never be too good at it. As unit troopers, the pressure is really on to up their game to SAS satisfaction. Load action. We're going for the top left target. Stand by. Up. Unload, clear weapons. There's no, there's, you can't have an error. You just got to be good at it. Good grouping. Tighten it up. But things are about to get a whole lot tougher. Up. Next, they must train with a gas mask and full body armor. And these high-tech battle fatigues come with their own set of handicaps. It gives you sort of uh, like tunnel vision, so you've got to move your head a lot more. Drills that once seemed instinctive have to be relearned to cope with this radically different perspective. You've been doing all these drills, all this training, without anything interfering. Suddenly just a little one millimetre, two millimetres is just putting off balance. OK, first target, top centre. At first, everything seems impossible. you got this little handicap and it becomes a little frustrating to start off with. Ensuring they can shoot with accuracy means spending day after day in the battle training facility. You'll be on that range every day from morning till dusk, maybe into the night. just to get that one shot right. It's a vital skill that has saved the lives of NZSAS troopers in the past. Oh! We heard these Vietnamese voices yapping. I said, Jesus, what's that? He said, Charlie. A New Zealand SAS patrol would have one more deadly task to perform at the end of an eight-day reconnaissance in the jungles of Vietnam. And then on the last day, we're probably starting to stink a bit, that someone sort of got suspicious. One of the guys sort of come past and stopped out front. Heard a scrape, and because we'd only been there a short time, I didn't really know what it was. I thought it was a cigarette lighter, but later on, now that I know, and that was this, actually the safety catch in his AK. Yeah, he, he was suspicious, but probably gutless, you know, didn't want to ever go because if he had done anything, he was all over for him. My plan was to have four of us in the killer group. So we're lying there and we, uh, yeah, well, well, a couple came, so. Uh, so um, what I did was, um, I just, Aim my rifle and when his chest hit the sight, so I just operated the trigger and... I think we're in a really high state of excitement at this stage of the game. And the body didn't look like a body, it just looked like a bundle of rags actually. And I thought I thought that he'd dropped his pack and scarf and that I'd missed the bugger. Oh man, I was shaking like Billy O, you know. Uh, I didn't feel frightened, it was just that uh, that's how my body reacted and I was really, yeah, really used to shake like buggery, yeah. Forty years on, the SAS's newest counter-terrorism troopers must adjust to life in a gas mask to learn the latest CT tactics. It makes it harder to breathe, so again, your fitness levels need to be up there. 
In this first month, they're weaned into a world of limited vision and controlled breathing until it becomes natural to every action. A lot of training is done in the gas mask so that the soldiers get used to wearing it. So when they have to wear it, they're comfortable. The importance of performing with masks is about to be made abundantly clear. It was something on the CT course that you lived in. It's time for these soldiers to personally experience a deadly threat which traces back to the First World War. Chemical, biological and radiological. Agent 15, sarin, soman, cyclosarin, hydrogen cyanide, all deadly chemical weapons. Now the soldiers must get a taste of what they're up against. We need to be able to operate in those environments should the worst possible situation occur. They will be exposed to a chemical compound, painful but not lethal. The exposure to, you know, gases, sprays and all that makes sure we, oh, I can cope with this, it's going to be over and done within five seconds. A dish of chlorobenzalmalonitrile, better known as CS gas, is cooked in a confined space. Now the gas masks, which have become their second skin, are removed. You've got to be in there and taste it and experience it. The effects of the CS gas are instant. Oh, it's not nice. It's, it's, it's horrible. Yeah, it hurts. It really hurts. <laughs> But pain is a necessary part of learning. Yep, been here before. Yep, breathe, breathe, breathe. Yep, clean my eyes up. Hey, mate, I've just been hit with this. Cool, clean up, keep going forward. This is just the start of counter-terrorism training for the new troopers. Their next training phase will prepare them to infiltrate New Zealand's largest city. With a lot of weapon skills in in-room combat, you learn to think quickly on your feet. You have to. If you can't, then you'll make a mistake. You make a mistake and someone will die. You've got to pick up threats or, or something that's not quite right and, and um, deal, deal with it straight away. You've got to know that it's a target to shoot, to kill, or you've got to, it's a safe one. It could be somebody putting his hands up there unless you see the weapon. So, you know, within a fraction of a second, a guy's got to learn how to react. Week six inside New Zealand's SAS headquarters, and the unit's five newest soldiers are ready to move to the next level of counter-terrorism training. Rehearsal for missions in urban settings. All attempts by the police and negotiating team to contact the terrorists have so far failed. The only communications have been a terrorist yelling from the doorway of the building. If the police approach, the hostages will be killed. Tempo just ramps up a little bit more. There is no sort of, this is, you know, just a rehearsal. You know, this, there is a, there's an end, there's a, there's a goal. By now they're living, breathing the SAS life. Even their response time on a day off is tested. You could be at the movies. Beeper goes off, give the girl a kiss and hand over your jaffas and off you go. There's a set procedure to every step. In today's world that we live in, you know, there are real threats out there. Threats that can materialise um, almost instantaneously. This training is not for if, but when. The mission, the CTT, is to move by 1800 hours today. The recce car is already gone, and that was the OC Delta 1, 12, and the SIG. I want int 6. Until and now, the five new troopers have been blooded into A Squadron's broad counter terrorism training. Our lads disappear. Now, each man must learn the functions of working in a small counter terrorism patrol. You do have to start from the bottom and receive the counsel and wisdom of those who have gone ahead because they will learn innovative techniques. They will know the specific improvisations required for various theaters. You ultimately leave the fourth wheel to a patrol that's on operations. Do they trust you? 
Are you going to hold up? Are you going to be good enough? Got a schematic of the interior. It's just a basic four room layout. Don't take too long. You keep your mouth shut and you learn off them. That's what you do. This patrol is preparing to clear rooms and search for hostages in an exercise designed to sharpen reactions. Your senses now are really fired up. You know, focus on capturing what mental images you had in your head before you went through, i.e. what the layout of the rooms were. Though sometimes compared to secret agent James Bond, in reality, SAS soldiers have no license to kill. Stand by, stand by, go. Their actions are strictly governed by domestic and international laws. Everything's split second. Working at speed, the patrol aims to neutralise the terrorist threat without harming the civilians. For the new troopers, the consequences of any mistakes have been drummed home. That training could be the difference between an innocent, um, the difference between you going to prison. For the five new troopers, striving to attain SAS standard while mastering the complexities of counter-terrorism brings extra pressure. That's the, uh, the tricks of the trade. It's business. So they must practice and practice. Everything is preparing them for potential domestic or international operations. The New Zealand Security Forces, we're here to rescue you. And they bide their time for the chance to fight in the international war on terror. The room is not safe. Gas, gas. First year in the black roll, it was a huge learning curve again. You're really homing your skills. Now the new troopers move to the infiltration phase of counter-terrorism training. During cycle, they learn the basics of helicopter infiltration in an open environment. Now they must train for very different terrain, an assault on New Zealand's largest city. May be just where the SAS have to exercise their skills in the event of a terrorist attack. Like most NZSAS missions, the infiltration will be done under the cover of darkness. There is no margin of error above the Queen City, with the weight of each soldier's body armour and weaponry adding to the challenge of unpredictable winds. You've done the drill so many times, you know something's wrong and you focus back on it. But some things are just going to become instinctive. A concrete structure replaces soft grass. This training is a far cry from actual combat infiltration because there are no enemy bullets here. But in Vietnam in 1969, an NZSAS patrol would be fighting for their lives after a chopper infiltration. You really didn't, I didn't worry, and I don't think anybody else did too much about the fact if you're going to be killed, and if you're killed, you're killed. The patrol was about to step straight into the sights of a waiting enemy. And we went into this huge, deserted rice paddy on the edge of some scrub. It was to be a, a five-day patrol, if I remember rightly. Their planned five-day mission would last only a matter of minutes once the Kiwis entered the scrub full of silent Vietnamese. The patrol lasted 26 minutes and we covered 26 metres. It was a hive of activity of whatever the enemy were. I couldn't tell you whether they were North Vietnamese or Viet Cong because it was the wet season and the grass was very, very tall. The soldiers scrambled to await a helicopter extraction. It was a big clearing, so there's quite a bit of time when you're exposed to the possibility of ground fire. Holding their nerve, the five New Zealanders fired over 400 rounds and launched 25 grenades. If everybody's yelling and shouting and nobody's listening, then it's chaos, isn't it? And we all stayed in a little tight bundle while they uh, 
sorted out the tree line with gunfire. Finally, armoured helicopters came to the aid of the besieged Kiwis. Escaping the overwhelming odds, it was one of the shortest missions in the entire Vietnam War. It's now time for the unit's newest troopers to face their most challenging counter-terrorism exercise, infiltration by night into downtown Auckland. At night, swarming on top of a high-rise building, you don't want to miss the spot. As they train, the five know there can be no mistake. They accept the challenge and they make it happen. They find a solution. They don't know about um, the word can't. They just say, well, if this is what we've got to do, well, we'll do it and find a way to do it. They became determined. They became extra alert. They're, they're kind of, uh, all their senses were finely tuned. In, in the final analysis, I think it's just their ability to think outside the square. The New Zealand SAS's newest troopers are now into their eighth week of counter-terrorism training. Our soldiers need to be comfortable working in built-up areas because they're the same skills that they're going to have to be drawn on uh, when they go into other theatres around the world. That includes gaining access to any building known as Method of Entry, or MOE. This footage of the Iranian embassy siege is one of the few records of SAS forces in action using MOE. We are used in the worst possible case where deadly force is necessary. The new troopers have moved to a training centre designed to refine their method of entry techniques. Whether rescuing hostages or assaulting an enemy force on foreign soil, their actions must be honed and sharpened to split-second precision. The keys to success generally have to do with stealth, surprise, and maneuver. Whether you do it in an urban scenario or whether you do it in a rural scenario is a tactical matter, but the strategy remains the same. You get the jump on the opponent before he becomes aware. The method of entry bunker is one of the deadliest facilities in which the new troopers will train. The purpose of that environment is to allow the soldiers to practice realism. And also in the MOE house, they can do mechanical and explosive entry techniques. Their first challenge, to gain access to the building with live explosives. The slightest error could prove fatal. Black rolls is, is pure punch. With method of entry, the five troopers are taught that every conceivable route into a building must be exploited. It's about having a bit of brain power, a bit of thought. Brutality, using brains, that's how we get into places. It's intensive training. The new troopers rehearse and rehearse for the real event, knowing on the actual day, nothing can be left to chance. You just got to get it right, you know, and you test it on it. Making sure your skills are up there. The five work on method of entry tactics, using many forms of transport. And at all hours of the day and night. I don't believe there's ever been a Prime Minister who hasn't seen the team and been impressed. We had uh, put them in our, in our training house, I'll call it, and we had uh, a couple of balloon-headed terrorists alongside them. We were talking quietly to them and suddenly in, in burst the, uh, the team and um, using live rounds, suddenly there were no balloons on the heads of the terrorists. And the sort of shock impact without trying to wipe out our, our Prime Ministers, um, 
um, and shop them too much. Um, the shop impact, I think, was was essential to them understanding the the power and the capability of the of the team. You know, it gave them a huge confidence. Deep inside the MOE house, counter-terrorism skills are taken to the limit. You've got to be concentrating all the time because it's live rounds. In this suffocating environment, danger lurks at every turn, so teamwork and 100% awareness are paramount. It is serious, extremely serious if you do make a mistake. And even whilst in training, a mistake could mean your, your buddy. Storming through locked doors with live explosives, the new troopers must save the hostages by neutralising the enemy. Your awareness needs to be heightened. Your recognition needs to be honed. Bang, you're in there, you're looking at women and children. Decision's back on you. Make a decision. The only way that you're going to win is, is, is to ensure that you've got a heightened sense really, and your reactions are a lot quicker than everybody else. In the MOE house, mistakes can be rectified, but in the real world, that luxury doesn't exist. And what happens if you're shooting at two men and they put women in front of them? Those two men, you know, are on a plane to kill 5,000 people. You're gonna make a decision. All weapons, I should hear, all weapons clear. All weapons clear. For this patrol, it's been a textbook exercise. A trooper that joins this unit should be able to uh, analyse a situation and get it sorted. Because they've picked you for your attitude, they've picked you for your learning ability, so there shouldn't be a problem. All weapons clear! All weapons clear! This is the last phase of training in a controlled environment. Now the five new troopers will be tested in a real urban area. Since 9-11, the battlefields have moved to the cities of the world. It was entirely an offensive operation that meshed all the elements of guerrilla warfare uh, in one fell swoop. Surprise, maneuver, uh, economy of force, uh, and symbolism. In counter-terrorism training for urban environments, the squadron must infiltrate an actual city. In this case, Auckland. Auckland's simple. Auckland is a, is a simple city. It's not a very big city. The buildings represent a small suburb in America. At dusk, the exercise begins. Three months of training have centred on this night. You, you know the aim. Um, you've been given all the tools to achieve that aim. Can't afford mistakes. You can't afford mistakes because people get hurt. I mean, you've done rehearsals, you've done practices. You're at the high end of it now. You're expecting everyone else to do their job. Two blacked out helicopters take the new troopers on their first urban assault operation. Their goal is to land safely on designated targets above Auckland streets, then descend without being discovered. It's taken less than an hour for the choppers to reach the very heart of New Zealand's largest city. bright lights to illuminate the way, the pilots steady the helicopters. For the troopers, their focus is purely on landing safely and undetected. You've got to have a firm grip on the helicopter. <laughs> Don't let go. With an unsuspecting city below them, the helicopters approach the drop zone. Suddenly, the wind picks up. There's so many things going on. You've got to trust other people to get their jobs done right. You've got to put some trust back in those helicopter pilots. Oh, 
countless hours of training have come to this. 300 metres above Queen Street and against the backdrop of Auckland's iconic Sky Tower, the troopers begin their descent. The first part of the urban infiltration has gone according to plan. All troopers are safe and unseen by anyone. Across the city, the second operational team are also well underway as Auckland goes about its business, oblivious to the events quietly unfolding on its rooftops. Now the troopers must rapidly descend 63 storeys. urban assault is a success. The five new troopers have proven they can take a city. Next, they must prepare for the challenge that is the ultimate nightmare of any government anywhere. In their first 90 days in the NZSAS, the five new troopers have learned advanced counter-terrorism skills and earned the respect of their peers. The main focus there is gaining trust through performance because everybody's so competitive, everybody's so driven. But the greatest test of their short time in the unit is about to unfold. Now they must prove themselves in a full squadron exercise which replicates an escalating trend in the world of terrorism, a hostage situation. A video reveals armed terrorists with civilian hostages and the NZSAS is called to undertake a counter-terrorism rescue. It will test everything the five new men have learned since joining the unit. Negotiations for the hostages' release have failed. With execution looming, the unit must respond. In a combined operation with police and other armed forces, the NZSAS will spearhead a rescue attempt involving the five new troopers. So obviously the police and the wider New Zealand Defence Force performs a role in uh, terrorist-related incidents. At one end of the spectrum, our unique skills may be called upon. This exercise has taken months of planning and is conducted as a real hostage crisis. It's very real and you can't afford to make errors on it. And you've got to, it's testing everything you've learned. For the five new troopers, the experience has been intense. Now they must show their peers they can perform under extreme pressure. The internal pressure within the unit to perform is just as horrific. And they are seeing what your decisions are. Everyone's seeing what your decisions are. Carefully, NZSAS marksmen and surveillance teams move into position. It's all very much black and white, really. No enemy and out of that comes strengths and weaknesses. Inside, military personnel are playing the roles of hostages and hostage takers with a chilling realism. This is all about training and testing of our training procedures, so the information that's picked up from outside has to look realistic. With surveillance established, the unit prepares in a state of constant readiness. What they then need to do is to react to events as they unfold and come up with a plan to defeat the terrorists. You're thinking about what you're going to be doing. The training, go through your drills. The unit waits for night to begin the rescue. This is exactly what the SAS have been training for. They were the people who had those skills. If it went beyond a police emergency, then there had to be somebody to back them up. They have to be able to be calm, and they have to be the storm at the other end of it. The good old thing of the dawn raids is sort of gone. Uh, we, we, we love the night. We're better equipped for it. The clock is ticking, but the soldiers must be patient for the right moment to spring their rescue attempt. 
For the five new troopers, 11 weeks of counter-terrorism training have reached a climax. They prepare in calm to bring on the storm. As the deadline for execution looms, the squadron readies for action. You get one chance to get it right. So the pressure is on. You know, you've got to, you've got to perform. The counter-terrorism teams move into position with silence and precision. Five new troopers have met expectations, yet each knows this is only a dress rehearsal for the real thing. Exercise you always take seriously, but you're still that one step off 110%, aren't you? You know, operations is, is life and death. The hostage exercise marks the end of the counter-terrorism phase for the five new troopers. The CT or second phase is almost like the home straight you are feeling a little more like you're part of it because at the end of that course, you can be deployed. Now the five will prepare for what every NZSAS soldier aspires to, overseas deployment. Everyone joins a unit to go on operations. You know, it's what everyone aspires to do. It's all you're here for is to do your job. Yeah, you're here to do your job. Next week, our cameras will follow the five new troopers as they undertake advanced combat training. For the first time ever, you will see how NZSAS soldiers prepare for the ultimate military experience, overseas deployment. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air. This is Main Street Papakura, and these are the veterans of the Long Range Desert Group, the LRDG, who in World War II fought a clandestine campaign against Hitler's armies in North Africa. Alongside the LRDG was a tiny military unit whose reputation would be forged in the desert, the British SAS. Members of the Long Range Desert Group, we honour you for your service to your country. Today, as the veterans are honoured, a new generation of young Kiwi men is preparing to fight overseas. They are the soldiers of the New Zealand SAS.
After a gruelling selection and nine months of training, five of New Zealand's top soldiers were chosen for New Zealand's elite fighting unit, one NZSAS. You are now one of us. You don't need to go to your head because that's just the beginning. Their initial task was to train for 21st century warfare. September 11th, 2001, saw this unit transform itself to meet a new and emerging threat. But first, they would begin at the bottom. If you can't pick up a broom, a sweep, we use humility. Briefed as to the expectations of an NZSAS soldier, the five were immersed into counter-terrorism training. You're ultimately the fourth wheel to a patrol that's on operations. Do they trust you? Are you going to be good enough? After proving themselves in CT, now they must move from urban battlefields to the open terrain. After three months inside New Zealand's most secretive military unit, life has changed considerably for its five newest members. Training wheels have come off. The burden and responsibility goes back on you, you know, to go and do a bit more, more of your own training. Though still on probation, they're more at ease with a life where only immediate family and friends are aware of their real profession. Most of the people know that you're in the army, and, and you know, I mean, the army's a big place. The, or, or you're in the navy. <laughs> Whatever sort of suits you on the day, really. They speed it up now. Although each excelled in the counter-terrorism training, the five know without combat experience under their belts, they're far from being true NZSAS soldiers. You want to get out there, you want to be deployed, you want to go on operations, and you want to test everything you've learned. It's all you're here for is to do your job. Yeah, you're here to do your job. The next six months will be spent on advanced combat training, also known as Green Roll. Green Roll Squadron is that element that would deploy offshore to conduct sort of what we would term to be traditional war or combat operations. The first phase of Green Roll is advanced infiltration. The troops are mainly environmental. So for example, the amphibious troop conducts waterborne operations. The air troop, its infiltration skill is advanced parachuting and the mountain troop carries out climbing tasks and operations above the snow line. During the nine month cycle of training, the five experienced all the infiltration techniques. Now they'll be assigned to one permanently. The squadron commander gives notice to the five. One will go to amphibious troop, three to air troop. Yeah, I can fall like a rock so you can be air troop. And the last man to mountain troop. With their troop allocations decided, the five now begin their advanced infiltration training. OK, so by the end of it, training here is, uh, as we've already discussed, looking at uh, your own infill skill training. So with the exercise in particular, we'll be concentrating on basic survival there. We'll be looking at uh, snow caves and those sort of elements we've spoken through. For the five, there is an additional private challenge to meet. That is to earn the respect of their NZSAS peers. You know, after a while, in some cases it took uh, a year and a half, uh, Fia would actually come up and say, hello, how you going? And then from that time, you sort of realise that you're accepted into the uh, unit. They're very Joe cool, and if I'm sure you've noticed, you sit around and have a conversation, but there are a lot of silences. Because, you know, they sit there and, they, and somebody will start up something. Very difficult to have a real conversation with them. They just nod and they, yeah, mate, and there'll be a silence for five minutes. You don't want people who have absence of emotion, they're dangerous because they can't experience fear. Therefore, they'll do things without thinking about the consequences. The soldier selected for mountain troop must learn to infiltrate into some of the harshest and deadliest alpine conditions in New Zealand. You see, soldier is about being able to fit in with adapt or mould to his environment. Mountain Troop's newest member soon discovers the endurance levels needed to travel across the Southern Alps are unlike anything he's faced before. As they continue their dogged progress, they stop only to hide the tracks of their skis to confuse any enemy. The temperature falls further and the terrain worsens. No one says a word. This is all in a day's work for Mountain Troop. There are people who operate far from any comfort zone, far from any safety zone, and they do so for extended periods of time. 
As the weather closes in, they have no choice but to make camp. Just working out the best systems, you know, and just mentally hardening up. Because you're going to freeze. I mean, you look at Shackleton and those guys in the Antarctic. They, they survived all those years ago, and there's still guys in New Zealand who got all the stuff on them and die. But for three days, there is no improvement in the conditions. With an intended supply drop two days away on foot and depleted rations, they move into survival mode. Self-preservation is great training. It makes you think about yourself. Um, and you've got, it's got to be cold and brutal like that. Eventually, it's the sniper rifle that keeps them fed. Not a moment too soon. A fast-moving weather front forces mountain troop into another phase of training. With no time to waste, they must abandon the tents and build a snow cave. This ice home will protect them from the elements, and here they must stay until the weather clears. We probably crammed six or seven years' worth of work into that day. There's no eight-hour day. There's no knocking off for a break, you know, this is my break and we, we're going to have a break. Uh, if I felt that we couldn't have a meal, we didn't have a meal. After five days, the weather finally breaks and with it the chance to get fresh supplies. For Mountain Troop's newest member, it's been a baptism of endurance. For one of his mates, the challenge is not in the Alpine cold, but in Auckland's bustling port, where the newest soldier in Anfib Troop is about to take part in a covert nighttime infiltration. Those people who are advanced swimmers, they all go into the amphibious troop. In silence, the NZSAS divers slip into the water from a small jetty. Their target is a ferry, doubling as an enemy vessel. Fifteen metres below the surface, the divers navigate along the harbour floor. The team must now use maximum stealth and speed to board the ship. On the upper decks are patrolling guards, their movements furtively observed by an NZSAS support craft. In this exercise, Anfib troop must board the craft by scaling its starboard side. And the clock is ticking. Once the guards finish a sweep of the deck, the divers have just five minutes to seize the ship's bridge. The first NZSAS trooper makes a rapid ascent up the equivalent of a 10-storey building. At the top, he gives the all clear to the rest of the team. Stand by. Go. One by one, the rest of the patrol make their way on board. Now they head towards the bridge, sweeping rooms as they go. With the guards returning to the ship, the patrol has only seconds to reach the bridge unseen. Stand by. Go. Amphib's newest member sticks to the drills and keeps pace with his colleagues. The patrol makes it to the bridge completely undetected. The mission a success, the new soldier's performance flawless. Next, it's the turn of Air Troop's three newest members. I remember one time going on a parachute jump at night. There were seven of us. Two people broke their legs and, and another person injured his shoulder. So I didn't sleep for the entire parachute course, I just had a nightmare. Started at the beginning of the course and finished at the end of the course. I think I was saying uh, the Lord's Prayer at the time, <laughs> probably. The newest troopers of one NZSAS are about to take a quantum leap in their air infiltration skills. Well, the reason for learning infiltration skills uh, speaks for itself. It's so you can get in there and do your job. On cycle, the three prove their basic parachute ability. Dangle and thump, you know, you fall and you hit the ground hard. He has to learn how to jump out of a plane at pre-fall level, uh, if that's to be a speciality. For Air Troop's three newest soldiers, the objective is to free-fall from altitudes up to 12,000 feet, 
navigating long distances across the sky, completely on their own. There is absolutely no margin for error. The first port of call is not a Hercules transporter, but a simulator. Here, the three troopers can learn the art of skydiving without risking life and limb. But it takes time to master freefall. It will take him a number of years to accrue the necessary experience to become a, a master freefall within the troop. You know, he's at the bottom of the pile of experience. Finally, Air Troop's new members are deemed ready for their first solo freefall jump. Freefall SAS style bears no resemblance to recreational parachuting. Its purpose is to transport armed soldiers to specific locations without them being seen. At high altitude, the air becomes so thin that breathing without aid can lead to a blackout. But that's not the only obstacle for Air Troop's three new soldiers. I reckon the military can wreck anything that, was, that could be fun in the civvy world. They uh, put a big pack on you, tell you to get out the back door. Once out the back, the added weight of the pack sends them hurtling towards Earth at 140 miles per hour. As the air rushes past, each man battles to remain balanced. Once in control, the three must navigate to the landing zone. To get there, they become human rockets as they propel across the sky. Over the landing zone, the canopy's open. It's been a textbook air infiltration. leads to this process of continuous improvement. Everybody wants to do better next time, and the next time, and the next time, and you're constantly trying to get better and better and better. And it also means that you get to the stage very quickly in a small group of men where you know you can absolutely trust the person in front of you and behind you and to your left or your right. Before the five new troopers will be sent on an overseas deployment, there is much to learn. But their time will come soon enough. Unlike a lot of conventional forces, they will see action early and often in their operational life. The operational tempo of the New Zealand Defence Force uh, since the 90s has been incredible with all the deployments to the UN type operations and, and then the, the problems closer to home. On every wall of the NZSAS headquarters are images and symbols which act as a daily reminder to its newest members of what being part of this unit is all about, active combat. Too small to fight alone, the New Zealand SAS has proven its ability to fight with its international allies in any theatre of war for more than 50 years. Whether in jungle or desert, the NZSAS's hallmark is versatility. From Malaya in the 50s to the American-led war on terror in Afghanistan today. Their ability to undertake you know, challenging missions uh, to then deliver on those missions. To go in to do the reconnaissance work that is required and to be involved in the direct action that is required. The SAS have been involved in those sort of operations. They have done their work well. They have been respected by the other forces that they have worked with. They received a presidential citation for their work alongside American Special Forces in Afghanistan. If you walk into any bar in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, where the U.S. Army Special Forces Command is located. And you walk in that bar and you throw down your coin, as it's said, which identifies you as New Zealand SAS. You will be shouted beers until far into the night. World-class standards and tremendous versatility 
is what makes a New Zealand SAS soldier. The five new troopers are conscious they must prove they have the right stuff too. To function as a highly effective small patrol, the five must hone their skills. Within the patrol, we need an advanced medic, an advanced signaller, we need a tracker, we need a demolitions expert. We put that all together, and that makes a pretty awesome patrol, doesn't it? For 15 intensive weeks, the new troopers advance their individual skills. The main reason we get into photo compression is to reduce the transmission time on the radio. The longer you transmit, the more chance there is that you'll be detected. We operate only in small teams, so you've got to be able to pick up different skill sets. As part of a small NZSAS patrol, the five must show they have the versatility and variety of disciplines to cope with any situation. You can't have a unit of just specialists. You need to have uh, cross skills, cross functional areas. Move! Hand-to-hand -hand combat is taken to the next level. Presume your enemy is bigger, stronger, fitter, faster, more skilled, bent on killing you, and he's armed. If it's kill or get killed, the first thing that he should know is that his airway's been destroyed. His spinal cord's been severed, Move. a finger's gone through his eyeball, his leg is broken. It's very much about aggression, but at the same time it's also about control. This is about the most elemental aspects of warfare. One man against another man, in the field, using their wits and guile to defeat each other, often in a very deadly embrace. During this time, the five are also taking their troop skills to expert levels. The Amphib troop members work on distance and depth in their diving. Those in air troop increase their heights and distances travelled and at night. And mountain troop adapts ground skills to fit the unique terrain. Wherever possible, the five are introduced to real-life settings using live rounds. Here, enemy communications are the designated target of this unopposed mission. While a beach headland is the object of an amphibious assault. Finally, the 15 weeks is over. Next up, a return to inhospitable Waiuru. You take it for granted when you're training together, because you're just training, or you're going to war together. But underneath it all, you're building up this close friendship and trust that'll last you, uh, you know, even better than your own family ties. Maybe you rely on each other, your life. You, know, you rely on the guy next to you. Um, to look after you when you know when um, things are happening and uh, your life's on the line. You've got to have feelings, or else you won't survive. Yeah, you've got to worry about other people, not only yourself. That's the whole thing about the the four men or the five man patrol. In their fifth month of their advanced NZSAS training, the unit's five new troopers are back at Waiuru. As soon as you get to that signpost saying Waru, it starts raining. Guaranteed. Here on cycle, they learnt a variety of weapons and tactics as they forged basic SAS patrol skills. They begin to specialise uh, in a much more acute manner in the various disciplines that they're going to need uh, in the places that they are going to be deployed. Now they must advance these skills to operational level for potential deployment on missions to places like Afghanistan. It's shining what you've got, taking the rough edges off it and being able to employ it at the right time. If you're out in the middle of nowhere and it's happening, you make sure your mates are right. You're watching their back. Everything they've learned in this time at Waiuru will one day be applied in overseas deployment, gathering intelligence, tracking down enemy munitions, and calling in superior firepower. Having the discipline, the long-term objectivity to get the information back to an airbase, back to uh, people so you can execute the bigger job. As winter drags on, the five troopers continue to upskill their abilities. As a patrol, they learn to blend into the landscape.
As specialist snipers, working in pairs, they must merge seamlessly into any environment. Acquire the concentration to lie in wait for hours at a time. yet able to respond at a moment's notice. And bullseye a target from up to 800 metres away. How to pick where the enemy's going to be, how to pick where the enemy's been, how to pick where the enemy is likely to go, and how to pick the enemy before the enemy picks you. After a long winter, the grounds begin to firm. By now, the five are working as an effective NZSAS combat patrol. But as they practice more direct action training, this time with explosives, the five are conscious what they lack and want is actual operational experience. The unit commanders understand this frustration and impatience. They once had it themselves. And one Wairu winter 50 years ago, so too did the original soldiers of the NZSAS squadron waiting for their first overseas deployment to help the British Special Air Service fight communist insurgents in Malaya. The only way to get at them was to go into the deep jungle. And so this is why they had the SAS who could go into the deep jungle and stay there. The odds were stacked against the Kiwis. A lack of necessary parachute experience would be their first major hurdle. But there was an Irish fellow there, and the commander said to him, uh, what do I do if one of these ropes break that I'm swinging on? And the uh, structure said, well, say after me, our father, that in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and carry on. Having trained in the snowy mountains of Waiuru, the New Zealanders were badly prepared for the humid jungle conditions. But they gritted their teeth and got stuck in. Why we would train in the snows of Waiuru in, in preparation for the, the humidity and heat of Malaya remains to be a mystery. It was a complete change for us to go through the swamps and just experience the humidity, the rain and the, the things like leeches. You could hear the dead leaves, you could actually hear them rattle as the leeches came towards you. One guy had uh, one up his penis and they were, we learnt later that you get a cigarette, that's what we did. A cigarette, you just touch him with a cigarette and they fall off. Slowly the originals grew accustomed to jungle ways. In particular, the Māori members helped greatly in winning the hearts and minds of locals, who in turn helped them train as trackers, providing vital intelligence. In those days, I think it was just the attitude of New Zealanders working with, with other people that um, into that friendship and gained information. The originals developed new jungle warfare techniques. You could only hear the sound of your own movement when you were moving quickly. You couldn't hear the sound of movement or any noise from the opposition. So we decided to slow down and we decided to get off the tracks, what we call contouring. Perhaps we didn't cover as much ground, but I believe we covered the ground much more carefully. The originals made such a huge impact in this jungle warfare, they were instrumental in bringing down the communists. The jungle is the same for you and for your enemy. One who makes the best use of the jungle that survives. Today, the legacy of the originals inspires the five new troopers. And after a winter of advanced training, they've taken their skills to the next level. But this training must be put into context. The first time hopping off a helicopter in the middle of a foreign country, you're a long way from any help should you need it. That can be quite daunting. The five will now take part in a squadron exercise mimicking operational conditions and pit them with experienced NZSAS troopers. Those are the guys that will take you and, um, and hone your skills. As dusk falls, the mission begins with the five aboard. Their objective, the destruction of two enemy targets. The patrol will be dropped into water at speed, a highly risky manoeuvre. The reason the chopper can't slow to deposit the men is to prevent enemy radar from detecting their presence.
Although the snows have thawed, the water remains icy cold. But here the soldiers must stay for several hours. By nightfall, the current has carried their numbed bodies closer to the targets. Now they split into two teams, the five spread among both. Up to their necks in the freezing water, the first team struggles to attach explosives to submerged power lines. The second team heads inland to the mock dam. Like any actual mission, where there is only one chance to complete the task, so too with this exercise. In total silence, the new troopers work to complete the exercise to the standard of their mission-proven colleagues. You keep your mouth shut and you learn off them. That's what you do, because there's so many guys with amazing skills here. With the explosives in place, the teams move quickly to their pre-arranged meeting point. On cue, the extraction chopper arrives and the teams are uplifted with all on board. But this is only the first part of the mission. The patrol's success tonight will be gauged by their objective being successfully completed. And it is. Tonight, the five have proved themselves amongst their peers. Their time at Waiuru is now over. They're more physically robust, they're more mentally robust. Their level of expertise has gone up exponentially with the amount of training that they've had. The next stage in their education can only come from deployment. Well, that's what you've trained for. You know, fingers crossed, the beeper goes off, you're waiting, hopefully it's you. Back at HQ, the five are invited to experience one of the unit's rare times of formality, and by its standards, pomp. This is the unit's annual regimental dinner, a living roll of honour, where rookies and veterans of the NZSAS sit side by side. It's probably the time where everyone sits and reflects. This unit's done a lot, and it will do a lot, and it's important that its, its heritage is respected. Your country may be small in numbers, but it's a giant in the size of its contribution to the world. The greatest asset with which New Zealand is blessed is the quality of its people. And the New Zealand SAS epitomises all that is outstanding in this brave country. Being among illustrious company makes the five troopers even more eager to deploy. When you've got that uh, heritage and that past, it gives strength to the guys. And they know that, you know, people have done it in the past, they can do it. Those members here tonight from the original squadron and those past members of the unit, you can be assured that today's SAS group maintain the same ethos, strive for the same standards of excellence as you have done. This is a defining moment for the five troopers as they are accepted into the Brotherhood, that is, one NZSAS. Soon, it will be their turn. The guys all believe that you just couldn't just go cold on operations. There was always a live firing uh, rehearsals before you went on any operation. When I spoke to the other guys, they all went through the same process. And you train and train and train and train, and then all of a sudden you're really doing it. We've got to understand that quite clearly, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt, that Operation Claret means that if you are taken on the other side, um, um, all knowledge will be denied to your presence over there. The international war on terror is hotting up. And New Zealand's involvement is being discussed. If there is to be a deployment, there needs to be the political decision made uh, by the government. Is this an operation that New Zealand should be involved in and how can we best respond to that? If it is urgent, a small group of ministers will come together. The ministers will consider the situation, be briefed entirely on it. We'll consider whether the uh, preconditions of a New Zealand deployment have been properly met. 
for one NZSAS, whether they deploy or not, is in the hands of the government. Everyone has to be prepared and have everything in order so that if short contingencies arise, then that they're in a position to respond. While awaiting Wellington's decision, the unit trains to an operational level of capability, OLOC. So we need to have our bags packed and the equipment on the shelves ready to use. For the five troopers, experiencing OLOC will be as close as they get to the real thing. If we look at Afghanistan, for example, you know, strategic reconnaissance, you know, looking at sensitive sites, um, exploiting sensitive sites in terms of you know, where uh, munitions have been kept. In the event of such missions, the unit must be combat ready. It starts sinking in when you start issuing more specialist equipment, you start focusing on jobs. The five rehearse the dangerous parachute infiltration. At a military airbase, the soldiers run through the operation specifics over and over. First, they'll have to identify a landing spot chosen by agents on the ground. Upon landing, and without being detected, their mission objective is to find and then destroy an enemy weapon site. At some stage, they will encounter an opposing force. It's a matter of ultimately giving you an insight and preparing you for the real thing. As the five slip into the night, the countdown on this first taste of combat has begun. People do get killed and hurt, but the job at the end of the day, which is the most important part, has to be completed, even if it's just you by yourself. And it's that type of um, ideology that the unit teaches. Somebody's got to do it, and you might be the last one in the patrol, and you've still got to try and do that job to achieve the goal that was uh, asked of her. And that's the difference between us and um, the outsiders. In terrain which resembles the landscape of Afghanistan, a local agent prepares the landing site with a marker. This flare is the only guide for the parachutists. Weighed down with a full pack, weapons, night vision equipment and explosives, the journey to Earth is as dangerous as any mission they will undertake. falling into an abyss, you know, pure darkness. It's, uh, it's freaky, it really is. You, you can't explain it unless you go and actually jump at night. For the five, the real test now begins. Taking formation, they arc across the sky. Accuracy is everything, with surrounding power lines, roads and lakes, all acting as obstacles to the infiltration. Once you hit the bottom, it's, uh, it's the beginning of your job. You're not only thinking about how you're going to get in, but you're thinking about your mission. Get it done and, um, and get out. Landing safely, they must now track more than 15 kilometres over rugged terrain. The night vision goggles, the only source of illumination. Their mission is an enemy target stockpiled with munitions. Ahead lies the certainty they will encounter enemy forces somewhere along the way. You know it's, it's going to come thick and fast, and you don't know when it's going to end. Live ammunition will be used throughout, and like an actual mission, the soldiers have no idea when the enemy will appear or from where.
But after three hours, there's still been no sign of the enemy. And now the target is at hand. Checking all is clear, the patrol commander commits to going in. While some soldiers trade fire with the enemy, the rest of the patrol lay their charges. Working calmly among the confusion, the troopers complete their task and beat a textbook retreat. The next time they do this will be on foreign soil. The New Zealand SAS is an elite fighting unit, part of an international coalition. Often covertly, it deploys its troops all over the world, helping in humanitarian causes and more recently, the international war on terror. For five new troopers, recent world events are about to become a reality. In an environment where a decision might need to be taken very quickly, within 24 hours, people can be uh, on, a, on a plane and heading to the destination where their services may be needed. The troopers must now play a waiting game. Will they be among those chosen if the government asks the NZSAS to be deployed? Everyone joins a unit to go on operations. You know, it's what everyone aspires to do. And so they wait. You started off at the beginning with the selection, holding on to my belt and beret. Deciding that this was going to be a career for me. And realising that I don't want to go anywhere else. Two years of training feel short compared to waiting for news. We didn't publicise what we did, and we had language to cover what we did to our families. You know, they just knew when we went, we went. We went over the hill, or language like that. When these chaps went somewhere, the wife didn't even know they were on an exercise or it was for real, let alone where they were. They just didn't know. Everything you've done for the last however many years you're in SS is, is, is up for this. Finally, the orders come through. One minute, you know, you're waiting out to hear who's going. Next minute, yeah, you're going, you're on a plane, let's go. All five troopers are going on their first deployment. Over 50 years ago, Major Frank Rennie trained the original NZSAS force to deploy overseas in the name of New Zealand. Now, half a century later, five more troopers take their place in this elite lineup. That's what you've trained for the last two years to get out there and put it all to good use. It's like an all black sticking the black jersey on, or a guy sticking the black jersey on for the first time. You're here to do your job, and that's what gives you all your satisfaction, is doing your job and doing it to the best you can. Knowing that you are carrying on a legacy. With maximum focus, but minimum fuss, the five troopers load their equipment ready for imminent departure. Unlike conventional soldiers, there's no fanfare for this unit on deployment. What the NZSAS has done in the past and will do in the future must remain a closely guarded secret. 
as these five are about to find out. Given that the government and the SAS have a neither confirm or deny policy, we will never know the full extent of places to which these fellows are sent. This is the moment when five troopers become NZSAS soldiers. This program was made with funding from New Zealand on air.